All right, here we go. At Blue Sheep 2, this video is going to be for you. I guess I'm going to post it public because I really don't have that many subs. I'm not going to ruin anyone's day here. I don't know how bad the video could possibly... Well, I don't know how video, bad... I, I don't know. People on my channel are going to be interested in this comment anyway. It's very interesting stuff here. I'm going to open up this. This is a Canadian... This is a Canadian rye. I just made a very long video on Vlad doing a response video. I'm doing a response video to Vlad doing Is Mormonism a Cult? <sighs> Yum. Delicious. Here we go. Yes, Blue Sheep 2, you need to change your username. Do it uh, Christ Sheep or something like that. If it's taken, Christ Sheep too. It would be perfect. Blue, Even just Blue Sheep to Christ. Blue Sheep for Christ. And you're going to notice the worst YouTube comments you would ever leave for the year. The by far the worst comment. You're cussing someone out. In the middle of cussing someone out, the Holy Spirit's going to come in. Now with that, use your name... And you're going to say, what? And you're going to say, ah! And then you're going to delete it. And it's going to help your tongue. Rain in the tongue. And you might you might say something. And then you might delete it within a few seconds. That username really holds you back. I used to have my real name, Eric Smythe 14 I used to say some really messed up things to people with my real name. Then I changed Eric Smythe for Christ. Changed everything. But my name on here, this is probably my weakest name, Eric LDS. But... Um, Eric LDS, at Eric LDS. I don't know what I'm going to change it. I want to change, maybe I'll change it. But anyways, yeah, change this. Blue Sheep 2. Um, usually I'd say capitalize, but your name I think looks cool, lowercase, for this. If you're going to keep it, I think the lowercase is probably good. Anyways, here we go. This was the first time I've ever been responding to in a video. I know the feeling, because it happened to me before. And yes, it does feel, uh, makes me feel special because you're just someone commenting and then you get a video in response. So, yeah. But I'm mostly making this for God and for myself. The topic is so entertaining. But it, I'm not, I'm not going to lie, I'm not really doing it for just one image bearer of God um, alone. So yeah, it's maybe 1% for you and 9% for the second grace commandment. And then, I don't know, maybe 30% for myself and then the rest is for God. Everything you do, do it for the Lord. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. It was fun to listen to someone evaluate my post. Oh, great. Well, that's why I'm doing this. Maybe 2% is, is for you. Or 3%. Feel free to respond however you like in the future. Videos communicate thought better than text. I agree. Let your girl know. Okay, that was my cousin. So let your it's my cousin. She her name is Julia. Let your girl know that when I was speaking of scripture, I wasn't talking about the Book of Mormon. I was talking about the Bible. I would never call the Book of Mormon scripture. Yes, I know this. She does think the Book of Mormon is scripture. So. I don't exactly know what part of this that maybe she was confused about because she pro she knows she knows that you know that the Book of Mormon is not scripture. You said that you weren't sure if you refuted me enough, but other than the quick statement about Isaiah fourteen fourteen, you didn't refute me at all. LOL. Yes, um, I realized that. Um, I did realize that actually while I was reading it. I was like, you know, this guy probably doesn't, um, it was just so weird because it was like, a lot of that stuff was just, uh, blatant, you know, agree to disagree type of stuff. Uh, we, the, the whole point, I, you know, that video, I really wasn't talking to you in that video, even though I made it and I sent it to you, it was really me talking to Julia. Julia was 
uh, my cousin in the room. And I wasn't really, I didn't really care that much about you, to be honest, even though, you know, I did transfer some information to you. You, you could see my, uh, my, my, or you could hear my voice and stuff. You could at least see my heart there. Maybe I could go back and do it again. Um, and refute everything. But, um, you know, I could, re I, I don't even remember everything that was, everything that happened. But I will say this. I do remember, you know, you're making a case that Mormonism is Luciferian. And I used to say the same thing. I was probably, I don't know, two to three times more anti-Mormon than you back in the day. Maybe ten times more anti. Depends. I've, I've watched a thousand hours of anti-Mormon. Uh, 1,000 to 2,000. No more than 2,000 hours. But 2,000 hours is a lot. It's pretty much every... Not every video, but like a lot. I don't like the Exmo stuff as much. It's like I used to be Mormon. It's my identity. It's like, eh, You know, something, something polygamy. And I, I'm more into like Aaron Shafawalaf. God Loves Mormons there's a Facebook group I'm a part of called Christianity vs. Mormonism. I think you should join that group with us. Lots of toxic anti-Mormons on there. And I do some trolling and I agree with the anti-Mormons a lot. Um, the first couple of weeks I didn't agree with them at all, but they make some good points sometimes. Um, but yeah, God told me that the oldest church is true. And certainly whether it's true or not, I'm called to help them. And even if the church is true, there's still millions and millions of Mormons going to hell. They don't know God. They don't know the commandments. They don't repent. They're, you know, if you go to a church with perfect doctrine, you're still going to die and go to hell. The perfect doctrine is not going to save anyone. So, and then meanwhile, there's also people going to churches with horrible doctrine, faith alone and no repentance. No, once saved, always saved. But. The guy reads the Bible. He has a prayer life. He has obedience. He loves Jesus. He's friends with God. So I don't know. I don't know if you believe in repentance. But. Uh, you're definitely anti-Mormon here. But yeah. You're saying that LDS Church is Luciferian. That's what I used to think. But you know what? Lucifer wanted to be like God. In power. And he wanted to bring his character with him. Into that situation. Um, Mormons want, they do not want to be like God in power. They want the selflessness of God. They want humility. They want love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That is not a Luciferian pursuit. That is theosis, which is what Christians believe as well, which is the pursuit of Christ-likeness. First John 2, 4 says, um, we ought to walk as Jesus walked. So, yeah, we're trying to be like Jesus Christ in a very, 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 very similar way to Christians. So just look up the debate between James White and a Latter-day Saint. Can men become gods? The answer is yes. James White admits it halfway through the debate. It was very awkward. And the Latter-day Saint says, I'm not here to debate LDS theology. I'm here to debate, can men become gods? <laughs> and the answer is yes. The early church said yes. And sure, maybe the Latter-day Saints go about it in a way that's a little bit strange. But yeah, it's not real Luciferianism. It doesn't even sound like you tried to refute me other than scoffing at some of my comments. I agree. If I go back, I would say the same thing. But if you have any specific question or whatever, it's like, I mean, a lot of what you were saying is just, you buy into the wrong premise and then you just, you just take it and you just go off the rails. And I was kind of just laughing at it with Julia, but you know, Julia was actually on your side. I could tell. And she's like, yeah, but he makes some really good points. And, you know, I texted her. I've been texting her. Um, and she's good with it now. I have no idea what the comment theory is. Okay, so there's five different Joseph Smiths. 
Hollywood Joseph Smith, the one that you see in the Restoration movie. And he is the one who says, I will not stand for the swearing. And then the woman comes up and I do not like religion, but I do appreciate your kindness. And then he says, with all due respect, ma'am, that is our religion. So it's the peaches and cream version of like basically this guy who's slightly better than John the Baptist walking the earth. And that's Joseph. So that guy obviously doesn't exist. He's probably the most ridiculous ver. Well, yeah, he's probably the most ridiculous version. I guess maybe the second most ridiculous um, at this point. Based on my testimony, I would say it's the second most ridiculous. But it's this idea that Joseph Smith not only was he a true prophet, but he was also like a better version of Mother Teresa on the male side. Um, yeah. Then there's LDS Joseph Smith as number two. And that's just a whitewashed version of Joseph Smith where we forgot all about all of his sins. Jeremiah 31, 34 says, I'll forgive them their sins, remember it no more. Number three is con man Joseph Smith. This is basically Joseph Smith. He wrote the Book of Mormon himself. He's a con man. He's a treasure digger. This is the con man theory. And basically, he has no superpowers. He has no interaction with the devil. And he has no interaction with God either. And he's just, it's just a work of the flesh. So I think the con man theory is by, I would say, I would say by far the most ridiculous theory is the comment theory a lot of people when they bring it up i just lol laugh at them uh alma 36 now if there was no book of mormon then maybe maybe but the book of mormon is clearly a work of the devil uh so you can't just say he's a con man who doesn't use the devil the book of mormon is work of the devil or it's a work of god it's it's a divine origin source uh, there's a 26, I think it's a 26 layer chiasma in Alma 36. The whole chapter is this massive chiasma. And then there's hundreds of chiasmas. There's multiple authors in that book. The book is just crazy. The, the book's insane, that book. And the fact that he did it with the, with the seer stone and the golden plates and the hat, face of the hat. Uh, if you just look at how that book was made, his age, his... Uh, you can't just say he's a brilliant, you know, uh, J.R. Token super writer. And if you do, that's called comment theory. It's basically South Park, dum 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 dum. Now you know what the comment theory is. The fourth one, uh, the fourth Joseph Smith is called anti-Mormon Joseph Smith. The one that I held to a lot of my life. October 9th, I came up with this theory that Joseph Smith sold the soul of the devil. To write the Book of Mormon. The devil is certainly capable of writing the Book of Mormon. With all these chiasmas and the ancient writing. The multiple authors. The demons are extremely smart and tricky. So they'll give us a perfect book. Joseph Smith gets all the girls. And basically the idea is you lead them into polytheism. You lead them into an advanced gospel. That includes marriages. And paganism. And then a very strange Luciferian version of theosis. And what else? The temples, adding, yeah, basically adding circumcision to the gospel. And then you loop them all into hell the way the Protestants do with the Catholics. Romans eleven six says, uh, if it be by grace, there's no more work. It has to be all grace or all works. Ephesians 2, 8 to 9, say by grace, the faith not of works. So you basically create a works-based salvation. And the whole thing is a work of the devil, completely demonic. Uh, it's a religion for the Pharisees to mop up um it's just a work of the devil. That's jo that's Joseph Smith number four, called anti-Mormon Joseph Smith. And obviously he's a con man as well. Every false prophet is a con man, but not every con man is a false prophet. And then the fifth Joseph Smith is the reality Joseph Smith, the one that actually existed. And obviously we don't have access to that one. So we have to choose one of the other four based on the internet, our prayers, common sense, the book, reverse engineering, reading the Book of Mormon. But yeah, the peaches and cream, the, the con man one I think is the most ridiculous. The anti-Mormon one is the second most ridiculous. The whitewash one is the more ridiculous. And then, so the one that's probably closer to the truth outside of the reality one would be the LDS one. You just whitewash it a little bit. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Solomon, these guys had a lot of sin. And we throw it under the rug because we should. Same thing with Joseph Smith.
that's what the comment theory is. But this, hopefully, this video doesn't go on. I don't mind if the video goes long. But yeah, I just felt like saying that one. Is it a theory with a specific formulation or just a general theory that Joe Smith is a con artist? I think I answered that one. It's a very specific theory. It's it's my personal theory. My personal doctrine is called con man theory. It's not a uh, it's not a known you know anti Mormon term or anything. It's just something that I've used. I think Joseph Smith is a con man. And we know for a fact that he did con people in his early years. The information I wrote about Joseph Smith comes from a book, okay, which was written by Desert Books. That's where I got the information. His wife, Ponzi Scheme. Good for you. Great. So you're reading some anti-Mormon material here. Um, I read a book by Wilder, Michael, Mika Wilder. He's adorable. He's so cute. He's like a quasi. He believes in like pathetic repentance and stuff. And he left the church for grace. He's freaking hilarious, that guy. Very simple-minded guy. The story about walk on water scam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't remember the source. So he's a con man. Okay. The two more. Yeah, he's a very. He's a sinner. He sinned. The two Mormons wrote in their journals about a sermon about faith. He's a bipolar psycho, this guy. Invited the, <laughs> invited the church down to the river. Okay, the next morning Joseph gave another sermon. And proceeded to walk on the water. Okay, not enough faith. The third story was written by a boy. So it looks like there's some comment stuff going on here. Mm -hmm. I'm running out of energy. That's why I'm not reading it here. But I'm, I'm reading in my head here. As they finished, the boys decided as a prank to remove some of the boards in the middle. They went back the next day. Watch what happened. Here we go. Now you mentioned a few reasons you believe the Book of Mormon, you believe, prove the Book of Mormon is inspired. Chiasmas, the problem is that the Quran has a chiasma, vastly overshadows one of the final crimes. No, it doesn't mean he's a prophet. It means he's a false prophet. Um, the Quran, I believe, is demonic, so it still works. Um, it just means that it's, yeah, the Quran is a very demonic book. So it makes sense that there's chiasmas there. And also Muhammad um, is a little bit different than Joseph. Ancient writing structures. The above speaks of multiple authors. I might click on that later. Uh, multiple authors. 532 pages. Joseph couldn't write it. Uh, yeah. So, by the time you... If you write first and second Nephi and then you write Alma, you should just be done at that point. Look at the uh, DNC and the um, Prolegate Price. You really don't need to write that long of a book. But, I mean, I guess the theory is that Joseph Smith is just filled with this massive imagination. Um, and he's just like, yeah, we're going to have a... We're going to combine the book club. Um... Yeah, 532 is a, is a lot. You really don't need that much. Why not? He had 15 years to think about the story. The story is extremely repetitious. I kind of agree with that. Uh, but there are some different things going on there. Uh, a lot of people would disagree with it, but I have read the whole book. And I do... I mean, yeah, it's like the bad guys get destroyed and then the righteous people win over and over again. But I, I don't know... I don't know if a lot of people... I don't know if anyone on either side would agree with you other than me. He pulls chapters out of the Bible. That's true. There's very little unique thoughts behind what the Bible are. He just... Eh, I disagree with that, I guess. Um, I agree and disagree, I guess. I don't know. I really like King Benjamin. Um, the family community... Oh, my gosh... I, I read this earlier. 
Oh, wait. Oh, never mind. This is different than I remember. The family community, I imagine, comes from a few things, not necessarily the fruits, but I, they play a role, I imagine. One reason I feel akin to the Mormons is because of their family values. I hate families to death. Uh, Matthew 1037 says, if you don't hate your family, you cannot be to my disciple. I say, oh, well, hallelujah, amen, yes. I used to rip off my family. I would let the water bill not go unpaid so I can give to the poor. It was hilarious. And then first... And then I came across First Timothy five eight, and it says, "If you don't love your family, you're worse than the unbelievers." It basically goes without saying, and I was just like, "Wow, I am a scumbag." So then I started to love my family more because that verse. But I hate, I hate the second grace commandment with a passion. So I completely disagree with you here. Um, the, f the families, who cares? Human beings are sinners, and uh, sinners are a hot mess. So I don't need to, uh, you know. I mean, there's exceptions, right? It's like my best friend, kind of a cool guy, but even him, even them, I stay away from their bad side, and, you know. But you could pretty much throw all girls under the bus, you know. But we're talking about sinners right now. The family community, I feel akin to the Mormons because of their family values. It's, it's so hilarious. There was this girl, she was like, I remember when I first joined the church, 2011-ish, sitting in the pew, and she comes up, she's crying, and she says, I know the family's going to be forever, <laughs> and I just wanted to bust up laughing because that's one of the worst, dumbest things about... The religion is I have to be tied to my family for eternity. I just thought I was going to get, you know, put up with them for 60 years and then I could dip and have my Christ. I don't want my family forever. You know, I haven't met my future wife. Maybe I could take my wife forever. She's amazing, whoever she is. But man, but but even her, she's, she's kind of, I mean, we're talking about another human here but i will agree that god loves us and he wants us to love other people and to love our families more storge love in the greek is um love a family i'm not saying they're sinning because they love family actually i am actually the problem with the families ask any mormon who do you love more god or family Actually, let's start with Christians. Ask Christians, who do you love more, God or family? 100%, maybe 99.9% .9 will say uh, God. And if they say family, it's because they know that they're being honest. The family, you know, you could see them. A lot of people, they don't have a relationship with God, so they have to say family because they don't know him. But they've qualified for the Christian label because they went to church or whatever. They believe Jesus rose from the dead, so they think they're a follower of Christ. But, theologically speaking, you would never get away with that. Families over God. That's ridiculous. Why? Well, I, I, it's an epidemic in our church. People who love their family more than God. Ask any Mormon. Only about 94% of our church is going to say they love God more. 6%. That is a absurd amount. Six hundred thousand Mormons who love their who love families more than God. Elder Han on a mission. I said, "Who do you love more, family, God or families?" And it was a very disrespectful question. And I was using it as a stepladder to get to the next question. And he says, "Families." And I said, "What?" He said, "Families." So I showed him Matthew ten thirty seven. You're. You know, if you don't, if you love your father, mother, daughter more than me, you're unable to be my disciple. And he says, nope, families. And then the, the, the companion next to him was like, he's like, well, I would obviously disagree. <sighs> well, that's good. <laughs> it's called idolatry, you guys. It's called idolatry when you don't love God significantly more than your family. 
Jeffrey R. Holland can't even imagine heaven in the traditional sense without ha, 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 my wife. You can't. <laughs> of course you can't because you don't know God that well. Sorry, Jeffrey R. Holland. You know, the Quorum of the Fifteen, the Q12, the First and Second Presidency, and the Prophet, they're not there because they, they know God the best out of the 20 million. They're there because that's whatever, who we need right now or whatever. God called them up there. So you guys do you, but you don't know God. That's why I tell Elder Holland, you don't know God that well. Hopefully you know hopefully you know him enough to get to heaven. I met a woman here in Livermore walking her dog. I said, Hey, do you, do you love your dog? Yeah, I do. I'll give you ten million dollars for that dog. Nope. Ten million? You know how many water wells you could deal, build, dig in Africa? How many lives you could change? Just tip the waitress at two hundred dollars over and over again, and watch her light up. How is that not worth more than an animal? Our waitresses are being underpaid. But oh, you, you and your selfishness and your dog—they have that, you know, you know, attachment. I call it idolatry. The idolatry is real. So you say, okay, maybe they just hate money. You know, they don't like money. They just love that dog. So then you say, okay. I asked her, who do you love more? I said, are you a Christian? She's like, yeah. What's your favorite Bible verse? I don't know. Do you love God? Yeah. Who do you love more? God or your dog? Ready for this? Are you ready for this? Are you ready for this, blue sheep? I don't know. <laughs> That's what she says. I don't know. You don't know. That's just one dog owner. We go to the second dog owner. Who do you have more, God or, or your family? God or families? And she says, I'm sorry. Uh, That's the Mormons. I say, God or your dog? This one, this dog was a little cuter. This one. I was wearing a Jesus jet, a sweatshirt. Jesus is my savior, something sweatshirt. It's back here. It's right here. Um, Jesus saves, says on it. And um, it's a very colorful jacket. It really helps me evangelize. And she goes, uh, can I love them the same? <laughs> can I love them the same? And I said, don't know. And she says, I love them the same. I don't, I don't want to pick, you know. No. And I said, no, no. And she's, she's walking away. She's walking away. I said, sister, no. You can't love them the same. And then I said, I was inspired. I said, you're going to hell. You're going to hell. There's nothing you can do. You're lost. Um, you're not going to make it. You're going to hell, you're going to hell, you're going to hell. And I just see, I just see her like, I just see the Holy Spirit just running up her legs, running up her chest. She starts shaking at the bits. And then she says, she yells, uh, uh, I love God more than my dog. And I said, yes, yes, sister, that's the one. Yes. And she's like, whoa. And I said, you're going to heaven now. I shouldn't have said that. But I said, you're going to heaven now. I wanted her to know that you qualify for heaven when you love God more than your dog. <laughs> Anyways. If you think a dog owner idolizes the dog, wait till you see Mormons idolize their family. Because families... Because dogs... Hey, it's a dog. You know, there's some rescue dogs maybe that are idle worthy. Canines, they sniff out the, the uh, criminals. You know, there's some dogs that are just great. But families, they're amazing. 
And some people have some amazing families out there. Image bearers of God, whatever. So the people idolize family because they're idol worthy, but not as much as God. <laughs> I'll tell you that. You have to have a pretty low view of God to bring God down to that level. Or to bring your family up to that level. And sometimes that's the dangers of LDS theology. When you have a high view of yourself as a seed of God. And you think that you're a son of God. And you think you're the same species as God somehow. The Christians, they theologically, they... they uh, They've really spent a lot of a lot of time and energy separating themselves, distancing themselves from God. But Latter day Saints not so much. And uh it opens the door to true idolatry. True idolatry is where you love something as much as God or more. Micro idolatry is where you love something more than it should be loved by a significant margin. And then the essence of idolatry is the entertainment of thoughts about God that are unworthy of him. Intellectual idolatry. 3% of our members at least have embraced the anti-Mormon view of God. And they are committing intellectual idolatry by believing that nonsense. Kwaku L is one of those people. He openly admits to worshiping a God that is not the most knowledgeable, not the most powerful, not the most epic, dope, awesome being in the cosmos. And only and he's just he misunderstood our theology, or maybe our theology is just bad. Whatever you want to call it. You can't do that. You can't say you can't God down. It's literally breaking the first commandment <laughs> of the Ten Commandments. No other gods. The overwhelming majority of the Old Testament, the whole theme is Yahweh's uniqueness as the origin source of all things, and all the other gods themselves are an abomination. Kwaku did say that he believes Yahweh is not the origin source of all things in any universe anywhere, according to Kwaku's understanding of Mormonism. And that is an abomination. So, if LDS theology tells you to give up on God, don't give up on God, give up on LDS theology. Having said that, um, Blue Sheep, 97% of our members don't even know what's going on. If they all knew at the same time, they would do... If they all were hit in the face... With anti-Mormon doctrine all at the same time, they would change the doctrine. But it's just not a big deal because none of us actually believe our own nonsense. Because it's ridiculous. Why would we believe that God is a second-class citizen? Why would we believe that Jesus is a second-class citizen? We don't. We don't preach it. We don't believe it. So, ask any, ask any Latter-day Saint. They'll give you a pretty maximized definition of God. Um, except for Kwaku, because Kwaku is a bit of a witch. Ask him his second favorite religion. If or if the church wasn't true, what's your second pick? He said a Wiccan. So that makes him a witch right there. I'm not just calling him names here. He is a witch. He is a black black Mormon apologist, and he he's one of those weird guys that loves angelic ecstasy more than God. Very strange that gun. He's a troll as well. Okay. One of the reasons I feel akin to the Mormons is because their family values. I think I covered that one. The extreme persecution that the original Mormons faced. Hey, I appreciate the shout out for that one. Most anti-Mormons would never say something like that. Uh, that's why they had, there was a lot of Jack Mormons. A Jack, a cultural Mormon is someone who practices and doesn't believe. The church is so good. The basketball team and stuff. People, they're like, wait, so if I get baptized, I get to join this community and pay 10% of my income? And they're like, yeah, well, let's do it. And that's that's called getting baptized for the wrong reason. They don't know God. 
You're supposed to have faith and repentance and then you get baptized. But people get baptized because they want to be Mormon. You know, happens a lot in Utah. It doesn't really happen that much outside of Utah. But, you know, some guys, their girlfriend's Mormon. You know, their fiance is Mormon. They don't think the religion's false. Maybe they get baptized. This might happen in Utah or something. I've heard of it happening in Utah, I think. Then they get baptized. That's Talk about getting baptized for the wrong reason. That's what David Benner, he says, you know, a lot of our members are going to hell. Like, <laughs> they're, uh, you know, they're not converted, you know. But a, a Jack Mormon is someone who believes and doesn't practice. Someone who believes the Book of Mormon is true, for example. But he's not LDS. Okay. This brings people together fast. And it forms lasting bonds and a sense of us against the world, I believe. Thus, in the future, I mean, how many other churches have protesters outside their conventions? Second, the Mormon community is small. And they tend to congregate together in cities, which goes back to just original city planning. Okay. Competition of the God's Church. I think this is better than mainstream Mormonism, but it's also lazy. Absolutely, it's lazy. Um, this is, uh, the church was built on laziness. There's two commandments in my church. Um, you have to love and have fun is number one. And number two, which is close to it, is the church is no burden. Matthew 23, 4, Jesus talks about he hates religious people because they're so, they put burdens on people do not lift a finger themselves. Mormon church, very burdensome religion. Lots of burden there. If you don't know God, you're going to be miserable as a Mormon. And I don't want that to happen in my church. We don't have callings. We have divine opportunities. D.O. Things that you do. And I encourage my members to turn down those callings as, as often as possible because we want to stick to the theme. So lazy is definitely the word. It's a church within a church. Um, it's an invisible church. I got my first and second counselor, Philip, Philip, Chris, Kyle. I got the prom king from Granada High School, CJ. Got Kevin Freed, and I have one girl, my cousin, Julia. Relief Society. I think this is better than mainstream Mormonism. Well, we definitely have the real God, I'll tell you that, because the God that we have is Jesus with cogwheels on his chest. If there's a bigger God than Jesus, then our soul is transferred to him, our worship, devotion, and obedience. So our our God is the biggest God at any universe anywhere. And he knows that, like I said, 97% of Mormons, when they pray, they think they're going to the biggest God anyway. Um, it's not until they're told to God down that they make that decision. Uh, Quaku was like, oh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints told me to um, worship a smaller God. I guess I'll do that. He's an idiot. He's retarded for that. And God's like, really? The God of Mormonism is basically some dude playing a dude disguised on the dude from another parallel universe who's scaling and he inherited a bunch of glory. It's basically Bruce Almighty is what it is. This is the, you know, the god of anti-Mormonism, so to speak. Um, there's a video on my channel. Um, it's a two-hour, 30-minute video. Hannah, I think it's called Hannah. A girl shares her gorgeous theology. Girl shares her gorgeous theology is what it's called. That's a very multi-cluster of uh, information on that one watched it four times. I still don't understand what's going on. Lots of intelligence. Lots of intelligences. I think this is better than mainstream Mormonism, but I think it's lazy. It's another way of saying I'm not really interested in truth. I'm interested in my current position and I'll give lip service to the true God if I'm wrong in hopes you'll understand. That's pretty good. Um, I am interested in the truth. Um, I think the LDS Church is true. Um, I'm a reformer, so, um, the ninth articles of faith says we're going to wing it and we're going to believe anything that everyone tells us. 
as long as they're a member of our church. That's the ninth articles of faith. So I can literally come in there and tell them anything. I've already done that to local wards. You could Mormons will believe anything. That's just, it's not a secret. It's just some of the most gullible people on earth. So that's the reason, that's one of the reasons why they believe all the crazy stuff that they believe. It's because it's the most gullible people rounded up. So they're as sheepy as you can get. I would say maybe 2%, 3% of our church. Um, eh, I'll say, I'll say 10, 15% of our church, maybe. It's not global. And they have some sort of something. You know, the Ken Jennings type. Um, intellectuals, and they have spiritual evidence. People like me, but a lot of people are just, they're just like, oh, some smart people believe it. Or uh, whatever. I don't know. I don't want to loop them all. Uh, but I would say it's pretty obvious that our members have the gift of faith. I mean, we don't just believe in Santa Claus. We believe in the Easter Bunny. But yeah, it's like, I mean, there are limits. I'm not saying there's not a single skeptical member in our church, but come on. It's not exactly a religion for the skeptics. So, yeah, I, I, went, I gave a talk the other day on how the Holy Bible is true and that the Bible has not lost its plain and precious parts. And I just, I basically just redefined what plain and precious parts was. Like at first they're like, whoa, 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 that goes against Joseph, which it does. But then I said, oh, what Joseph really meant was the interpretation is what's a problem. Because if you misinterpret the Bible, it's a disaster, right? So the Bible is a disaster and the Bible cannot be trusted when it's interpreted wrong. But it can't, but so that's what he meant when he said translated. He wasn't talking about the word of God itself. The eighth articles of faith says we believe the word of Bible to be the word of God as far as it's translated correctly. Our idiot dumbass uh sorry, I swore on there, but our dumbass members uh I try not to swear, but because it, it really hurts my brain and stuff. But yeah, our dumbass members, they um, they think the Bible can't be trusted. So as they're reading it, they can't trust anything they're reading. And it's just a bad way to read that book. Um, they're, just, they're just too skeptical as they read the Bible. So that's one of the biggest, I'd say the biggest lies. So that's why I cleaned it up. And I said, it's actually, the Bible is actually perfect. But if you read it wrong, then it's it's going to be a disaster. So, anyways, I got the whole thing recorded, by the way. I um, I could post that if you want. I think I have it scheduled for the future if you want to subscribe. Um, but yeah, the Bible is fine. Uh. I'm not really interested in truth. No, I have the truth, man. I'm good. I'm a... The whole point of the LDS Church is to bring people to God, and I already have God, so... I don't know what else I need. I mean, I have Jesus. I have the fullness of the gospel. I have Christ. I'm not exactly trying to find Jesus. I already have a fishing pole and a flamethrower. I'm already winning souls. I've already uh, damned my mom to hell for seven years and then led her to Christ. So yeah, I, I'm re not really interested in truth. No, that's not true at all. The reason why I have my own church, I'm the prophet of the church, is because um, oh, it's, it's giving. It's time to give what I have. I have the gift of knowledge. I have 305. I just memorized another one. 305 Bible verses memorized. I have them all written down, chapter and verse. I'm good. It's time to change the LDS Church. Make the LDS Church true again. Make the LDS Church great again. I'm interested in my current position, and I'll give lip service to the true God if I'm wrong. That's true. I will definitely give lip service to the true God if I'm wrong, as well as my the rest of my members of the church. And hopes he will understand. Just look to the God of gods and say, sorry. Sorry for being Mormon. 
He'll understand. Certainly Lucifer had pride. That is why he wanted to become a god. But the simple truth that in his heart he wanted to be a god. So a lot of our members are, again, dumbasses. And they do want to be god in a Luciferian way. So I'm going to throw you another bone. Because some of our members, we have 20 million. So yeah, some of them misunderstand our doctrine as bad as you. And they want to be god in a Luciferian way. And if you ever talk to them, tell them that's never going to happen. <laughs> if you want to be like God, you have to ask God. He has to say yes. And he's not going to give you all of his power. He has, God has an infinite amount of glory that he's willing to share. And he has an infinite amount of glory that he is not willing to share. You're, you cannot uh, extract the infinite amount of value that God is not willing to share. And I don't care what Quaku L has to say about it either you can earn you can earn your own glory um go get your own glory but yeah don't underestimate what god can give you though is what i would say to you um blue sheep blue sheep too i don't know why i keep forgetting your name Okay, do, do, do. one can say they humbly approach the topic of being a god, but in the end, what you do is still done in order to be a god. Yeah, you know, I was in a, I was in a, um, a talk. It was in Elsquam a long time ago, and the guy says, "What is the purpose of life?" And he was like the most arrogant guy I've ever seen in my life, and he was like all puff puff. And the guy would, and then everyone raised their hand, you know, get to heaven, first life again. And he says, so is that the purpose of life, to get to heaven? And then, you know, someone else would say another great answer, like, worship God. So is that the purpose of life, to worship God? And then I remember William Schill raised his hand. And he says, the purpose of life is to do the best you can with what you have. And he says, so is that the purpose of life? To do your best? And then finally, this kind of, you know, dark sounding kid in the corner raised his hand. He says, the purpose of life is to reach exaltation. And he says, great job reading the back of the manual, Smalls, or something like that. And I just remember sitting there, I was like, that's the worst answer of all of them. And I was Christian, and I just, I wanted to just yell and scream or whatever. Um, so I understand, you know, uh, where you're coming from here. But exaltation, we should really rename it to humiliation. Because we're trying to get, exalt ourselves into godhood so we could be the most humble beings in the cosmos, basically. The celestial kingdom, we get our feet washed. The celestial kingdom, we wash our feet. Luke 18, verse 14 says, He who exalts himself, like Lucifer, will be humbled, but he who exalts himself, or he who humbles himself like Christ and John the Baptist will be what? Exalted. And that's what the Doctrine of Exaltation is named after. You humble yourself into exaltation. And you're exalted into humility. One can say they humbly approach the topic of being a god. But in the end what you still do. Uh, but in the end what you do is still done in order to be a god. And again we're trying to get to be a god. So we can be Christ like. So we can serve God. And Christ. Theosis. And you're a smart guy. I don't know if that was a joke. You spelled misspelled your here. Y O U R E. You are a smart guy. It's, the, it's ironic. Um, you're trying to make it sound like you're not a smart guy with this one. And you are, and you're a smart guy. So you, so could you explain how this makes any sense anyway? Yes, I think I just explained it pretty well. If becoming a god is about knowledge, as Joseph taught, 
I don't even know that if becoming a god is about knowledge. Yeah, it's a lot more than just knowledge. Um, You're thinking of like Gnostics. But yeah, I mean, it's like, obviously, uh, when you scale up through exaltation and exaltation, you're picking up attributes, uh, character traits, and knowledge is a part of that. But like, yeah, it's like, if becoming a god is about knowledge is just taught, then what does morality have to do with becoming a god? Yeah, morality... um, Morality... Is uh, well, it depends what you mean by morality, I guess. It's um, it's not so much the morality, it's holiness, it's uh, closeness to God. The friendships of God, they uh, there's special gifts that God gives to some creatures and not to the other ones. Matthew five forty five says it, ju- it rains on the just and the unjust. Acts seventeen twenty five says, uh, life and breath and everything else comes from the Lord. Moroni 1018, every good and perfect gift cometh of Christ. But there are some gifts that, you know, if 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 I'm if I'm working at a pizza shop or or, if, or whatever and I or if I see someone, a girl abroad, and she's like, Hey, I want I'm I am i do not have any food. I'm I'm hungry. Carl's Jr., Kathy Richardson. You know, she's hungry. Carl's Jr. Okay, here's some money. My sister of humanity, here's a gift. And then she buys it and she eats it. Delicious. Okay. Now, um, there's other girls. I give them an engagement ring, ten thousand dollars. Why is that? Well, they've met they've met certain qualifications. They're beautiful. This one's beautiful to me. But also, you know, we're in love. So yes, I'm gonna give her a different gift. This one, because I love her. You know. And we're in love in a special way. Now, the first girl, I'm in love with her too. That's why I bought her Carl's Jr. But again, agape versus filial versus eros versus storge versus epithumia. Five different types of love here. So becoming like a god is accessing the depths of God and the depths of his love, the depths of his filial love. It's accepting that engagement ring. And um, I don't know if that's exactly what Joseph Smith taught, but that's certainly... What I'm going to tell you that he taught. And if he didn't teach that, I'll just overpower all of his stuff because I'm in a cult. And the Ninth Articles of Faith says I can overpower all the previous prophets. And the guy who comes after me can do what he wants to my doctrine, too. Because the new stuff trumps the old stuff because I'm in a cult. So I hope that answers your question. Blue Sheep 2. Um... We're going to pray. Here we go. Dear God of gods, dear Christ, and any, or let's see, the biggest God in any universe anywhere. Thank you, Lord. And sometimes I'll start the prayer prayer like this with Mormons too. Make sure we're going to the same guy here. Thank you, Lord, so much for everything. Thank you for... uh, Whew. Wow. Lots of stuff. Massive thank you list on that one. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. A lot of things are coming to my mind. I might as well just pray for them in tongues here. Um, but yeah, I do like to start with the thank yous. First Thessalonians. Chapter 5. Be very thankful, thankful, thankful. Lord, I pray for the listeners and the viewers that we may all get to know Jesus and whatever religion we're in, that we may not offend you with our beliefs, especially idolatry, because Lord knows, and a lot of people, they don't even think they're committing idolatry. They would never admit that. But in your eyes, a lot of Christians are committing idolatry. A lot of Latter-day Saints are committing adultery, so. (sighs) Loving you less than 100% is a sin. Loving God less than 51% is idolatry. We should not be loving everything combined as much as we love God. That's ridiculous. So, pray for our hearts that it would be 
mer- merged with the Lord. That our will would be merged with the Lord. I pray for confusion. That confusion would go away. God is not the author of confusion. First Corinthians twelve forty seven, twelve twenty seven. Another says uh, the something something body of Christ. We all play a little role there. So Lord, I pray that I may be the humorous and would really link people together. Psalm one thirty three one talks about unity, the unity of God. Lord, I pray that you would use me the way that you use the way that you want to use me, and um, pretty much no limits on that one. All I ask is that it's fun and that it feels good. I uh, I don't really want to go through the Job test, but uh, I wouldn't mind going through John the Baptist, getting my head cut off. I don't mind that. I pray that you would help us. Avoid the Antichrist following him and avoid the mark of the beast. Keep us from sin, trials, temptations. And Lord, help us to repent of sins and to... Lord, I pray for our future... um, The future blessings, future wife, whoever she is. May she be amazing. Hope she's having a good day. And I hope she's um, studying the scriptures and praying. (laughs) Please, Lord, help us to um, be Christ-like. 1 John 2, 4 says, Anyone who says, I know God and keeps not the commandments is a liar and the Spirit of God is not in him. So, Lord, help us love others as we love ourselves. And above all, love God with all of our hearts, our mind, and strength. Say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, man.